discussing on the topic of defeating disappointment. Defeating disappointment. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning and you'd open them to Mark, the Gospel as written and recorded by the Apostle Mark, chapter 14. Amen. Defeating disappointment. Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 32, and if you'd stand with me this morning in honor of the reading of God's Word, today I read from the King James text, and the Word of God declares, and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he saith to his disciples, sit ye here while I pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is, is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Master, we thank you, God, for your word today. We thank you, Jesus, for the encouragement it brings to our souls. God, you've placed a word in my heart for this moment in time. There will be those that will hear this message in this building. There will be those that hear it, God, by tape. There will be many, God, that will hear it on the Internet. And there's not a word that I can say that could help anybody outside of the anointing and the presence of the Holy Ghost. God, today I need your help, and I humble myself in your presence, acknowledging, Lord, how greatly I must lean on the Spirit of the Lord if I'm to deliver a word that can be of any help or any strength or any encouragement to God's people. Help me this hour, Lord, to deliver this word as you've placed it in my spirit with fire and fervor that the people of God might receive it within them, grafted into their soul and their very being. Grant it, we pray, God, for we ask it right now in none other than Jesus' revealed precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. If there is anything in this world that is able to defeat the child of God, if there is anything in this world that is able to destroy the spiritual well-being of one of God's people, it is the issue of disappointment. Amen. We've all experienced disappointment in our lives. There's not a one of us that at some point and some time have not felt the great pain and discouragement that is visited upon us when we are visited by disappointment. Amen. We've had marriages that fail and we're grossly disappointed. We have relationships that fail and we are miserably disappointed. We have high hopes and high dreams and we do not realize our hopes and our dreams, at least not as quickly as we might like to. And in some instances, we've established hopes and dreams based upon another individual and they somehow fail us and we become so disappointed. Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane on this day, and he was so grieved in his spirit, for he knew exactly what was coming. And the three men that he held closest to him, the three men that he counted on the most, the three men that he allowed uh, to the inner circle, into the inner circle, as it were, of his ministry, 
They didn't seem to share his burden. They didn't seem to understand the weight that he was under. Somehow he was so grieved that all he could do was cry out, Oh, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And yet Peter, James, and John, all they could find to do was sleep. How many times have we been in relationship situations and we wish that our partner could understand the weight that we're under. We wish that they could understand what we're experiencing and we expect that they should and we expect that they would, but somehow or another they don't. And we're disappointed. We're disappointed that they don't seem to get it. They just don't understand what I'm going through. They just don't understand. Honey, that's human nature. Amen. If I'm not going through it, I'm not going to understand it. If I haven't been through it, I cannot sympathize with you. I can only sympathize if I've been there. Otherwise, the best I can do is empathize. And sometimes I can't even empathize because it's just too far removed from me. The disciples were not that wonderful, glorious mixture of divinity with humanity as was the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, they couldn't even begin to empathize with him. They couldn't even begin to understand what he was going through as his flesh was crying out to the Spirit, Have mercy, oh, prevent me if it's possible from having to go down the path that I have to go down. How could they possibly understand what the Lord was going through? They were nothing like Jesus. They, they didn't have an experience anywhere near like that of Jesus. They couldn't possibly understand it. The Bible tells us that through the course of the night, three times the Lord came back and found his disciples sleeping. What a disappointment. I wanted you to pray with me. I wanted you to support me at this hour. I wanted you to be there for me at one of the most difficult times in my entire life and ministry. I wanted you to be there for me. How many Sundays do we come to church and folks don't come and we get discouraged because we're disappointed that more people are not coming out to support and to help the work that we're trying to do. And that disappointment sometimes makes you want to stop. And that disappointment sometimes makes you want to quit. And sometimes the process is more difficult than the prize seems to be worth. Amen. Sometimes the process seems to be more than the prize is possibly worth. But it's not. There are thousands of people in this city today, as well as in the greater Dallas area, who one day are going to be Holy Ghost filled, Jesus name baptized people because Jubilee is in this town. You may not see it today. See, in the garden, Jesus was having a hard time seeing resurrection morning. Amen. You hear me now? He, his flesh was having a hard time seeing resurrection morning. But resurrection morning was promised. Resurrection morning was written down on the calendar. It was as sure as the sunrise. But even though it was guaranteed, even though he knew in the depths of his spirit that it was coming, the process seemed at the moment to be far more grievous than the prize was worth. Do you hear me now? And the Lord told his disciples, the flesh indeed is willing. Excuse me, the flesh is not willing, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He said, in my spirit, I know that three days from now I'll rise again. But right now, in the here and now, this morning, with an empty church, I'm discouraged. Right now, in the here and now, with the situation being what it is, I'm discouraged. Discouraged by what? By disappointment. Because the three people that I count on the most couldn't even stand with me in this my, my most difficult hour. In one of the Gospels we're told that as Jesus prayed in the garden that his sweat became as drops of blood. His blood pressure rising under the tension and the weight of what he faced. I'll tell you, sometimes when God speaks to you, about things that are coming, and I've had this happen many times, and Jason used to say to me, I don't know how in the world you can 
handle it sometimes when the Lord will speak to you about situations and you know what's coming. You know exactly what's coming. And the weight of knowing. See, it would have been one thing if Calvary had taken the Lord by surprise. But it didn't. It didn't. He knew every... He anticipated every pain and every torment from the spikes that would be driven into his hands. He understood every pain and every torment of every moment and every hour that he would hang upon the cross until finally his final breath was drawn. He understood everything that was coming. He was well aware of everything that he faced. And his flesh was crying out for release and for relief because it was so difficult to have to face that future and that destiny. Sometimes it's so hard for us to realize our future and our destiny and what God has in store for us because we're so caught up in the here and now and we're so disappointed by the present circumstance. How disappointed must the Lord have been to have to speak the words in Mark chapter 14 and verse 42, Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. I knew he was going to do it. As we enjoyed the celebration of the Last Supper, as we enjoyed the celebration of the Passover feast, I made the comment that the one who had betrayed me was sitting right at this table. I made the comment that the one who had betrayed me was at that very moment reaching into the basket of bread and dipping into the oil. I made the I knew exactly who it was that would betray me. I knew exactly who it was that would hurt me grievously by betraying me. And yet, at this moment, I can't help but feel so disappointed. Can you imagine how disappointed Jesus felt? Not only could he not count on Peter, James, and John to pray with him for a while and to watch, but one of his own, one of his closest, one of the twelve, would turn on him for the sake of 30 pieces of silver and turn him into the religious zealots and the religious leadership of his day who sought only to destroy him. Can you imagine the great disappointment the Lord must have felt? Amen. Folks, we've known disappointment in our lives. We know disappointment every Sunday when we come to church and there aren't as many here as we'd like to see. We know disappointment when our mates and our partners and our friends don't do with us and for us what we think they ought to understand to do. I remember some years ago, I was trying so hard to do the right thing and to be the kind of person I was supposed to be, and I found a young lady who was, I guess you might say, wasn't bright enough to say no when I asked her to marry me. And Stacy agreed to marry me, and we got married, and then just weeks afterwards, suddenly her mother decides, we made a mistake, Stacy isn't ready for marriage. She's not ready. And they took her away, and I was left shattered because my future and my, in my present circumstance, I felt that my future was completely uncertain. If only I could have realized that resurrection morning was promised. If only I could have realized that the sun will come up in the morning. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. If only I could have realized that God was still in control of my life and nothing was beyond His ability. But no, instead I allowed my disappointment to bring upon me a great depression and that depression led me into a suicidal mindset. Before it was all said and done, I found myself in a hospital and it was there at the suggestion of the psychologists that I worked with that I found out that I was not as hurt or as wounded or as angry 
with Stacy as I thought I was at that time under the circumstances, so much as I was disappointed. Amen. Do you know a lot of the emotions that we feel, if we really look at it real careful, we'll find that the base, the root, the foundation of it is disappointment. You might say, well, Scott hurt me. What he did to me hurt me. No, it didn't. You're still alive. You've got a roof over your head. You're eating. He didn't do anything to set you back in the least. But what he did was disappoint you. You expected more out of him. You expected better out of him. You thought that he would do differently than he did. And the disappointment is the foundation of our pain. And the disappointment is the foundation of our hurt. And the disappointment is the cause of our wounds. And that's why today, if children of God are to be victorious, we've got to learn to defeat disappointment. Amen. And put disappointment in its grave, amen, so that we're not crippled by it. Praise God, I found out that my disappointment with the future that I thought I had, and all of a sudden I realized that that future that I thought I had with Stacy was not going to be realized. The cure that I thought I had found in Stacy, I was not going to have. And I was disappointed. Disappointed with the fact that I would never realize the future that I had envisioned. Oh, children, understand today, the Lord lived a life. His entire life was filled with constant and great disappointments. Peter says, Lord, if you say the word, I can come out on the water and I can walk with you. And the Lord says, oh, Peter's exercising faith. Praise God, what a wonderful thing. Okay, Peter, come on out. And here comes Peter walking on the water with Jesus. And all of a sudden he begins to sink because he starts to look at his present circumstance. Listen to me now. Instead of looking at Jesus. Amen. My Lord, have mercy. He began to look at the empty church instead of looking at Jesus. He began to look at the disappointing husband instead of looking at Jesus. He began to look at the partner that doesn't do what you think he ought to do, when you think he ought to do it, how you think he ought to do it, instead of looking at Jesus. And can you imagine how disappointed the Lord felt right then and there? Oh, look at that. I I thought Peter was finally getting it. And bless God, nope. How many times does the Lord look at us? I thought she was finally getting it. And then all of a sudden we slip right back into the old pattern. We slip right back into the old way. And we disappoint him. And we break his heart. He said, I thought she had gotten faith. I thought she figured out what faith was all about. I thought she finally understood that every circumstance God has in his hands, good or bad, they're all going to work out for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. Oh, I thought Tommy was finally getting it. I thought he was finally getting something in his head and understanding the thing. And just as sure as I thought he was getting there, he slid right on back to where he started from. My Lord, have mercy. We start to sink in the water because we're so busy looking at the circumstance around us at the moment instead of looking to the Lord. You hear me now? Oh, the preacher's preaching to the preacher this morning. I'm going to tell you right now. The preacher's preaching to the preacher because you have no idea how many Sundays that disappointment uh, just overwhelms my spirit. And I get so quiet, I don't even want to talk. I'm so disappointed by the circumstance. But God is saying today, you've got to learn to defeat disappointment. Because if you don't, disappointment will defeat you. Every week, every single week, I have to put disappointment to rest. So that I can find the courage and the stamina to get back up here in this pulpit again another Sunday. And every week I'm disappointed. But by Monday or Tuesday, I've already laid disappointment to rest because I cannot achieve the goal. I cannot reach the end. I cannot realize my dream if I do not lay disappointment to rest. I'm going to defeat disappointment because disappointment is not going to defeat me. 
Glory to God. The disciples are running around like scared rats on the ship as Jesus sleeps in the back part of the boat. And the ship is tossed to and fro, and they come to him screaming, Lord, don't you care that we perish? The Lord wakes up, looks up, sees the situation, addresses the situation, calls peace onto the scene, and then demands that the seas calm themselves. And hearing the voice of their Creator, the seas obey. But then the Bible tells us that the Lord immediately turns and rebukes and chastises His disciples. Why? Because He was disappointed with them. I thought you guys had it. I thought you guys had figured it out. I thought you guys had finally gotten something in your spirit that helped you to understand that as long as I'm in your boat, you're going to be okay. When I say let's go to the other side of the lake, I don't mean let's go into the middle of the lake and die because the wind and the seas are going to overcome us. When I say let's go to the other side of the lake, I mean we're going to get to the other side of the lake. Hallelujah. When I tell you to build a church, I mean do what you got to do to build a church because you're not going to be out there floundering forever. You're not going to be out there by yourself forever. One day there's going to be a church. You just got to roll the boat till you get to the other side. No matter how stormy it gets, no matter how windy it gets, no matter how dark it grows, you've got to know that if I said it, it will come to pass. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isn't that good? Good news. The Lord was disappointed with His disciples because of their unbelief. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. The very people who shouted on one day, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord. Just one day later are shouting, crucify him. And my Jesus is visited again by disappointment. Standing there before Pilate, hearing the voices that just... A day earlier, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, they cried. All shouting shouts of victory. And all of a sudden today they cursed him with death. Crucify him. Crucify him. How many times have we done that? Come to church and worship God to turn around and go home. And some circumstance comes along and we begin to curse God. Well, God, why are you? And we bring accusation against God. Well, God, why are you doing it? Why are you allowing this? Why are you? My Lord, have mercy. How many times do we do that? And our unbelief takes over. And we disappoint the Lord. Can you imagine how disappointed the Lord must have felt? The Bible said every hair on our head is numbered. Do you know that the Lord knew every one of those people by name? Oh, glory. Do you know that before they were created, He knew who they were? Do you know that standing there before Pilate, He could hear each voice independently? He said, that's Sarah yelling, crucify Him. That's Jonas crying, crucify Him. That's John screaming, crucify him. How can John do that? I healed his daughter. How can Sarah say that she was the one with the issue of blood? How can Jonas possibly declare this when I'm the one that delivered his son from the demoniac? Do you hear me today? I was in the midst of them a healer. I was in the midst of them a deliverer. I was in the midst of them the hand of God come to visit humanity. And now, today, after blessing me yesterday, today they curse me. Can you imagine how disappointed the Lord must have felt to be standing there and hearing these voices? Screaming out this condemnation against him, knowing that he had never lifted one evil hand toward them, but all he had ever done was visited them with good. Can you imagine how disappointed he must have been? I have to tell you, my message this morning is partly inspired by an email that I got from Sam Cater. Last week, I wrote an email about my 40th birthday, and Brother Cater sent me back 
an email, and in that email he said, Brother, I know how disappointing it is when people don't do what you think they ought to do and people don't act the way they're supposed to act. He said, I've been in ministry in Ohio now for 19 years. 19 years he's been pastoring in Ohio. He says, during this entire time, we've never probably had more than eight or ten people in 19 years. He said, but in the last month or two, there's been a breakthrough. He said, in the last month or two, we've begun to see growth. And people are beginning to pour into our church. He said, I don't even know where they're coming from, but they're coming. And he said, and suddenly our church is taking on a new life. And suddenly our church is taking on a whole new identity. And the power of God is moving in the midst of us. Honey, I've got news for you. No matter how dark the hour today, the reward tomorrow is greater than what we must endure today. It's not so bad to come to church and have to sit by yourself and hear the preacher preach just for you. It doesn't kill you to do that. If nobody else comes, it's all right. It doesn't hurt us to hear the word of the Lord for ourselves. It doesn't hurt us in the least, does it? It's not like, well, but you're taking time out of my week. I can't wash my car. I can't do my laundry. Well, let me ask you. How many times has being unable to wash your car or do your laundry caused your arms to fall off so you couldn't go to work on Monday morning? How many times has given up that hour or two for church, how many times has that caused you to uh, fall dead on the ground and not be able to get up and conduct your business the next day? It doesn't happen, does it? So it's really not costing you much. If it costs you anything at all, it's not costing you a whole lot. But you know what? It's not so bad either. Because we do get something out of it, don't we, Ma? I know I do. I get something out of church. I get some I don't care how many people are here. I get something out of it. I walk out of this place feeling better and more encouraged and feeling good and even when God speaks to us in a prophetic voice in our church and we know things that are coming and then as we begin to see those things come to pass. Did we have to have a thousand people in this building for the Lord to do that? No. As many as we had, He still spoke to us. As many as we had, He still warned us. As many as we had, He still gave us foreknowledge of what was coming. You understand what I'm saying? So it doesn't matter to me, Tommy, how many are in the building. It's disappointing that more people don't take advantage of what God is doing here. But you know what? I'm going to defeat disappointment because I'll be hanged if disappointment's going to defeat me. Out of ten lepers that the Lord had healed, only one felt it necessary to return and give God the praise. How disappointing. There's somebody that in this very ministry, since I've been in Dallas, I've done more for that young lady than I've done for anybody in this entire church visited loved ones who were sick, went to funerals of loved ones that had died. I did more for this one person than I have for anybody in the entire church, and I'm grateful for the opportunity because ministry is about service, and I welcome the opportunity to serve. But how disappointing it is when they decide, oh, well, I'd rather go to a bigger church. They've got more going on. I'd rather go somewhere else because they've got more. How disappointing is that for me? After everything I've done, you, you can't even appreciate it enough to be supportive until we get where we're trying to go. It's very disappointing. It's very disheartening. But Jesus experienced that disappointment. But nine out of ten, I got news for you. You pastor a church long enough, you'll find out 90% of the people couldn't care less. And 10% of them are going to be the ones who support and keep the church alive. In the average church, uh, they only have, if you're lucky, 10% of the people in the church will tithe. Because in the average church, it's only one in ten that care enough about the vision of the church to put their money where their mouth is and to put their money where their faith is. One in ten, just like the ten lepers, only one in ten. 
are going to come back and appreciate what God has done for them. Enough to make the effort to come back and say thank you. Our lives today can be filled with disappointments as we fail to realize our ideals and our dreams. So often we live in the moment, allowing ourselves to wallow in self-pity and frustration as our dreams are crushed by reality. And if it isn't the actions of others that disappoint us, it's our own actions. It's our own performance. It's our own conduct that brings us down the darkened halls of disappointment's prison. Amen? Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 14, the word of the Lord tells us, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, what I desire to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, if I do what I don't want to do, Paul says, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. This is the New King James this morning that I'm reading from. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. The desire is within me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, the good that I desire to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, the evil I don't want to do, he says, that I practice. He didn't say that I do. He said that I practice. You know what it is to practice something? You know what it is when a doctor has a practice? That means that he operates regularly doing what he knows to do. So Paul is saying, even though I know to do good, without fail, it just is just as sure as clockwork, I do the opposite. I practice. That's my practice. I'll do the exact opposite every time. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, in my flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. What is Paul saying in all of this? Exactly what Jesus said to his disciples in the Garden of Eden. The Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. There's a contradiction between the two. We may either today allow disappointment to cripple and paralyze us, or we can look beyond our disappointments to that day when we have conquered our obstacles, conquered our fears, conquered our humanity, and we have realized our greatest desires. Samuel could not have been more disappointed in the Old Testament couldn't possibly have been any more disappointed than anyone in human history with a man named Saul. The very first king that Israel would ever have, and Samuel was given the privilege of anointing Saul king over Israel. But did Saul act right? Did Saul do right? Did Saul please God? Did Saul desire to follow after God? No. Saul did everything he could to be a dog and to be a hideous thing, and to do everything he could wrong, and to do everything he could evil. And there's Samuel. I tried to take Saul under my wing. He was to be Israel's first king. I wanted him to be a successful king. I wanted him to be a great king. I wanted him to be a godly king. I did everything in my power to help to uh, create a king that would please God and honor him. But Saul instead turned out to be a tyrant. How disappointed Samuel must have been with Saul. 
But you know what, Tommy? This is the problem with letting disappointment defeat you instead of learning to defeat disappointment. Samuel could have given up and said, Oh, well, Lord, we tried. We tried to give Israel a king. We tried to give Israel godly leadership. We tried to give Israel a man that would listen to you and heed your warnings and lead according to the will of God. But Lord, it just didn't work. I quit. I give up. But in spite of his disappointment, Samuel did not quit. He did not let his disappointment defeat him. For when God spoke to him and said, Samuel, I want you to go now to the house of Jesse. There's someone there that I want you to anoint as the next king over Israel. Because Saul won't be here forever. The man's going to die. And somebody's going to take his place. And Samuel didn't say, no, Lord. Saul was a bad experiment. Saul was an experiment called a ride. Saul was a failure and a flop and a disappointment to me. I don't want to anoint another man king. No. Samuel put his disappointment to rest. He laid it in the grave. And then he went to the house of Jesse and found little David and anointed David king over Israel. And to this day, the word of God tells us that Messiah would come from the house of David. And Saul is never mentioned, but the great king of Israel, David, is the one that Messiah is accredited to. Because David was the king that could be a leader who led according to the will of God. David was a king who could be a leader who listened to the voice of God. David was the man who could do everything Saul never did. Hallelujah. Oh, but Samuel could have quit because he was disappointed. And Israel would have never had David. But he didn't. Ruth, how disappointing is it? I have an aunt named Allison whose husband died when she was just 30. It's awful young to be a widow. Four children that she had to care for on her own. I can only imagine that Allison was filled at that moment with horrendous disappointment. Her life was not going to go the way she thought it would. Things were not going to happen for her the way she thought they would happen. Nothing but doom and gloom probably filled her mind and set before her eyes as she considered and contemplated her future, just like Naomi Ruth, who lost her husband, Naomi's son. She had lost her husband. She was a widow at a young age. And at this point in history, a woman who was widowed practically had no value whatsoever. And yet Ruth, rather than letting disappointment defeat her, she said, no, I'm going to put my disappointment to rest. I'm going to lay it down in the grave and let it rot because I will not be defeated by disappointment. I will defeat my disappointment. And when her mother-in-law said to her, Ruth, go on home. You go back to your people now. You don't have any obligation to me. Ruth said, no, I'm going with you. Hallelujah. I've made up my mind that that's the direction I'm going to follow. And where you die is where I'll die. And your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. Hmm. And then Ruth, that little mother on welfare, as it were, having to go into the fields after the gleaners have already gone through the fields and picked all that they could possibly pick from the stalks of grain and the stalks of corn. Ruth would go in afterwards with the other widows and the other orphans, according to the law of Moses, and they would then pick the remnants, whatever was left over. But the field that Ruth regularly picked from belonged to a man named Boaz. And Boaz watched this young lady who loved her mother-in-law so much that even though she had no obligation to her mother-in-law, she made a commitment to her. And she, Boaz watched as Ruth refused to allow her disappointment with life 
to defeat her. And instead, she did what she had to do to care for Naomi as though it were her own flesh and blood. And Boaz watched, and as he watched, he began to love. And as time passed, a relationship developed, and Boaz and Ruth married. And Ruth became the savior of the entire Jewish nation. Isn't it something where God can bring you? Listen to me now. If you don't let disappointment defeat you. Isn't it amazing where God can take you? God took Ruth from being the little daughter-in-law of a poor widow Jewish woman and made her into a queen. Do you hear me now? Made her into a queen. He, she, he didn't hook her up with one of the men who worked in the field. He hooked her up with the man who owned the field. Hallelujah! Oh, glory to God! My husband disappointed me. That's all right. God will put somebody else in your life that won't. Amen. My friends disappointed me. That's all right. God will provide people who will not.